Well, if we look at naturally occurring uranium and thorium in rocks and sediments, you can readily calculate that you ought to produce on the order of 0.5 micro cc's of helium-4 per cubic meter of rock or sediment per year. And to the extent that this helium is not retained by solid phases, such that it is transferred to pore fluids, to the aqueous phase, you might imagine that the longer that water is in contact with rocks or sediments that are producing helium-4, the larger the helium-4 concentration will be in the aqueous phase. And that's the basis for the long-standing helium-4 dating technique of old groundwaters. Well, we've made some measurements in which the helium-4 production rate appears to be vastly different from this. The measurements are quite simple. We've taken material and placed them into an all-metal flask, pumped away all of the gas in there, sealed it up, and then we heat this for a prescribed period of time. We then put it back on the mass spectrometer and simply measure the amount of helium that has been released in that period of time. Very simple experiments. Um, in this case, this material happens to be clay-rich glacial tills. Well, if you take those results and you plot the log of the release rate versus the inverse temperature, what you very often find is that uh, in this solution space you get a line. And those of you that are familiar with diffusion processes might recognize that in that solution space, these data sort of suggest that the mechanism for releasing helium out of these solid phases is, is the diffusion one. The data are obeying an Arrhenius equation for solid state diffusion. If you extrapolate this to in situ temperatures, what you can calculate is that they ought to be releasing not 0.5, but 100 micro cc's of helium-4 per cubic meter of aquifer per year. The details of why this occurs is really the topic of a whole separate talk. For the moment, just think about this material as formerly being a part of the Canadian Shield uh, billion-year-old protolith that was bathed in a very high helium environment that was subsequently uh, eroded by glaciation, ground up into small particles, and is now releasing this helium in kind of a, a transient sense, releasing residual helium. You can readily calculate that it should do that uh, for maybe 100,000 to a million years. So although this release is transient, it's, it's going to last for long enough to be useful uh, the question is then, can we use this to say something about groundwater flow or maybe the lack of groundwater flow? Well, to demonstrate that, let me take you to Canada. So we're going to go uh, to uh, Lambton County, where John Cherry and a number of his students and colleagues have been studying these low permeability clay-rich tills. We know that they're of very low permeability from a number of different uh, uh, lines of evidence. One of my own students, Amy Sheldon, asked herself, what might I expect the helium-4 concentration in pore fluids to be as a function of depth, assuming that it is leaking out of all of these clay minerals within this clay-rich aquitard? So she did some simulations, shown here. And you can see that when the downward fluid velocity in this system is upwards of 50 millimeters per year, that's enough to essentially just sweep away all of the helium that's being produced, and it doesn't really build up much in the aquitard. However, as the fluid velocity gets small, you start to build up this helium, suggesting that profiles of helium might be a sensitive indicator of some very small fluid flow rates. So Amy goes to the site, uh, samples, uh, a, a nested piezometer. Each one of these is finished at a different depth in the system, and here's a typical result. We see large increases in the helium-4 concentration as a function of depth. This is the helium isotope ratio, which I won't talk too much about. She's modeled these systems, and you can fit these data quite well with a downward fluid velocity that's on the order of just four millimeters per year. And that's a rate at which solute transport is more controlled by molecular diffusion than it is advection. It's being perturbed by a small amount of advection, but it's mostly controlled by molecular diffusion. 
This is not the only site that we've made this observation. Let's stay in Canada. We'll go to Western Canada to uh, Saskatchewan, the King Research Site, where Jim Hendry and his colleagues have also been studying these low permeability clay-rich tills. And fundamentally, we see the same observation. Helium-4 as a function of depth and a large increase. Same pattern in the helium isotope ratio. We have modeled this system, in this case, using a fluid velocity that is virtually zero. With a production rate that we have measured in the laboratory. And what you can see is that after about 20,000 years, you fit these data reasonably well. You can actually fit them nearly perfectly if you apply a spatially variable production rate. We just don't have the data to justify that. So at least for the moment, I guess we're happy with this. What's important is to the best of our understanding, the emplacement age of this till is about 20,000 years. So there's a suggestion here that this till is retaining all of the helium, or most of the helium, that is being generated within it. And that sort of leads me to a first major conclusion. And that is that I think that these clay-rich tills are being tested in a rather interesting way. In a moment, I'm going to tell you about the minor isotope of helium, helium-3. In my lab, I can detect as small as of, uh, about uh, 10,000 atoms of helium-3. I can do that because my mass spectrometer is extraordinarily leak tight. How did I get it so leak tight? I tested it with helium. If helium doesn't pass through the jointing, almost nothing does. In a very real sense, these aquitards, I would claim, are being internally helium leak tested, and I would further claim that they are passing that test. And I think that we should therefore consider using these systems for their ability to isolate hazardous and potentially even radioactive wastes. I'm not sure how my colleagues in Canada feel about me saying that, but I think these have great potential for that possibility. Well, let me move away uh, from the major isotope of helium and talk about the minor isotope, helium-3. It is also produced in the subsurface, but through a very, very different mechanism. To understand this, we have to first talk about uh, tritium. This is uh, just a radioactive isotope of hydrogen. It's the most common of all the environmental tracers. It's short-lived, 12 years or so. It's just um, present as part of the water molecule, so it's a perfect tracer for water. Uh, and of course, its activity or concentration in the atmosphere was greatly enhanced from above ground nuclear weapons testing. Well, tritium beta decays to the noble gas helium-3. So you might imagine that if we were to measure both the parent and daughter isotopes here, we'd have the makings of a dating tool a potentially very powerful one known as the tritium-helium dating technique. There is, of course, some fine print here. And that's kind of illustrated as follows. The total amount of helium-3 that might be in a typical groundwater sample is not solely from tritium decay. There's helium-3 because there's helium-3 in the atmosphere. There's some helium-3 that can be produced in the subsurface via nuclear reactions, in particular an N-alpha reaction on lithium-6. The mantle is relatively rich in helium-3, and so there, if there's a component of mantle volatiles in our sample, we, we'd have to account for that. In practice, what we do is try to estimate this atmospheric component as the sum of a solubility, this we know very accurately from laboratory experiments, plus then this annoying excess air amount. We try to estimate this by also measuring neon, with the notion that neon is not produced in the subsurface. If groundwater has more neon than it ought to have, the excess neon would tell us how much extra atmospheric helium-3 should be there. That's the idea. The real problem is kind of illustrated by this pi. If that represents the total amount of helium-3 that might be in a typical shallow groundwater sample, we see that the biggest component is just this solubility term. The next biggest component could be, uh, typically, is this excess air amount. And the very smallest piece of the pie 
is the very thing that we need to put in this equation. So what we're forced to do is measure the total and by difference arrive at the very smallest piece of the pie. And of course, making sense of the difference between large numbers is a rather dangerous thing to do. What it means is you're going to have to make very, very precise measurements in order to use this technique. And as a young graduate student, I questioned whether or not that was possible. And suffice it to say, I went to some very simple sites where we had an independent measure of groundwater age, and I at least convinced myself that analytically we could make these measurements with sufficient precision to be useful. The question for me then was, is this useful to solve any hydrogeologic problems? To try to answer that and demonstrate that I think the answer is yes, let me take you to Cape Cod. Uh, we're still talking about glacial materials, but now these are outwash materials, sands and gravels that are very permeable. We're at the Massachusetts Military Reservation, and as many of you may know, uh, this happens to be sort of a groundwater high. Groundwater flows out radially in all directions, and so do some 300 or so groundwater plumes that are emanating from the Massachusetts Military Reservation. Uh, one such study was occurring near Snake Pond here and they had encountered some contamination doing a standard sort of plume chasing operation kind of shown in the cross section here trying to trace this plume back up to its origin and they lost it. Very common uh, occurrence in I think environmental consulting uh, hydrogeology. We were asked to come in and do some age dating to see if it would help with this problem. The first thing we did, and this turned out to be critical, is we installed a number of multi-level monitoring wells. That's critical in this context because it turns out that the age of groundwater is very, very highly stratified in the vertical. You need depth specific samples in, in this case. We installed those wells. We then collected samples for uh, tritium, collected samples for noble gases. And what you see here are apparent tritium helium ages as a function of depth below the water table for four separate multi-level monitoring wells. What I really want you to focus on is the slope of these curves. In fact, think about what units that has. This is a length per time. And indeed, it turns out the slope of this curve at virtually any depth that you want to look at it is a nearly direct measure of the vertical component of groundwater velocity. And if you know something about the effective porosity of the system, you know then something about the recharge rate. If you'll look at this near the water table, you can calculate V0 here, the vertical component of groundwater velocity near the water table. And as you can see here, that might be spatially variable. So we took these estimates of the spatial pattern of recharge, combined it with what we knew about some boundary conditions in the geology of the system, and did the simplest of all groundwater modeling exercises, we simply produced a flow net. We took one of those flow lines and just passed it through the plume, traced it back up to the water table, and indeed it turns out that that is the, the location of the source of contamination. There's a leaky pipeline here that, that people didn't know about. Why was the tritium helium dating technique useful at this site? I think the answer to that fundamentally uh, is contained in what information is needed to solve this flow net. You need two things. You need geology. You need the permeability. But unfortunately, as a geologist, I have to admit that that's not enough information. You have to have boundary conditions. These are boundary value problems, and what the tritium-helium data gave us is a nearly direct measure of that boundary fluid flux. Put the two together, and you do a much better job at constraining the detailed nature of flow paths. Well, let me turn away from gases that are produced in the subsurface to gases that are there either because I'm going to put them there or because the water was once in contact with the atmosphere. Uh, this is